people who have witnessed a violent fatality, how was your experience? Story 1. A friend and I had been mowing yards most of the day. We were in high school. He could buy beer. We stopped at the store, and I noticed a car parked on the side of the store. A man in a car was yelling at a woman inside the car. We got our beer, and my friend lived three houses away, and we sat on the porch, cooling down, having a beer. The car sped away from the store and went out of sight. In a couple of minutes, it was back. The yelling continued. The woman got out of the car, and the car sped away again. I thought that was strange. There was a side street that started right across from my friend's porch. The car turns onto that street and stops on the wrong side of the street in front of a house set back from the street a little bit. The man in the car opens the door and steps out. He's standing in between the car door and the seat, yelling at the house now. He's yelling in Spanish, so I couldn't understand what was being said. A man comes out of the house. He's not saying anything back to the yelling man. The man turns around and goes back into the house. My friend and I think that's the end. In about 20 seconds, the guy comes back out, levels a 22 revolver at the man in the car, fires once, sees the man drop, and goes back into the house. My friend and I can't believe what we just saw. We cautiously make our way over to the man lying in the street. No one comes to the house door, so we check on the man at our feet. I stoop down, and he has no pulse. He's got one tiny hole in his temple. A tiny trickle of blood, about two inches long, runs out of the hole. That's it. He's no longer alive. No pulse. He's not breathing. No moaning. Just nothing. We sat there with him till the cops came. We said we heard the shot and saw the guy walk away into the house, and that's it. We didn't say we saw it all. The man in the house admitted what he did. The cops let us leave, and we went back to the porch. My friend understood Spanish. He told me that the parts he could hear were about infidelity. We watched what went on for about an hour while we finished our beers. The whole thing, from the store to the shooting, didn't take five minutes. I saw that day how easy it was to end someone's life, have your own life ended, and how fast you could perish. I'm in my mid-fifties now, and I remember it like it happened an hour ago. All I'm going to say is, it changed me. I think I was 16. Story 2 I guess, in a way, I witnessed it, but I didn't have to see the gory details. This was July of 2005. I was 10. I was in Chicago with my family on a road trip. We were making our way from Washington State to Indiana for the Brickyard NASCAR race. We were stopping in Chicago for a few days to see the sights over there. We were right outside our hotel. It was probably around 2 in the afternoon. We were going to check into our hotel, about to get into the parking lot. About three or four cars ahead of us were minivans. The car gets the green light and goes forward. On the right side of the intersection, a pickup truck runs their red light and hits the minivan in the gas tank. The minivan is immediately engulfed in flames. I remember my dad got out of our truck and grabbed our tire iron, prepared to break glass on the burning car if he had to, in order to help get the people out. I remember my mom and I were in the truck watching this happen with tears running down our faces, and my brother was on the phone with 911. We learned that night that the pickup truck that ran the red light was being driven by a drunk driver. My dad, the other civilians, and the emergency responders were not able to get everyone out of the minivan. The youngest child, probably about seven or so, was in a car seat and burned alive in the minivan. It was really graphic and I mostly remember seeing a giant ball of flames and being scared because my dad was out there trying to do the best that he could. I remember you could hear the heat of the flames, and you could smell it. God, the smell was awful. The wreck happened right outside the parking lot which our hotel was in, and our window in the hotel room looked out onto the street where the wreck happened. It's strange to know I've been that close to a fatality. Now I always bear in mind that a vehicle has the capability of taking a life if not operated properly. Frick, drunk drivers are the freaking scum of the earth. I lost a friend in middle school to a drunk driver. I'm very non-violent and not very hateful, but with them, I just, you just don't want to know what I think they deserve. The commenter's perspective makes sense. Drunk drivers have ruined entire families. 
At the same time, unless it's known they deliberately made the choice to get behind the wheel, it's hard not to feel at least a little bit sorry for them. Imagine going out one night, thinking you'll knock a few back and have a little fun. Maybe this is something you have a problem with and should be asking for help. Maybe it's never gotten out of hand before and you've never had trouble getting home safely. Perhaps you've never even overdone it. Yet tonight you have a few too many. You wake up in the morning only to learn that you're responsible for taking a life. You have to live with that every day from now on. And if the person is coming from a bar, you have to wonder how nobody thought to take their keys away. It's such a senseless form of tragedy, yet it happens every day. Then again, in a thread like this, senseless tragedies are pretty much the whole theme. Story 3. Circa 2014. Where I'm from, we celebrate St. Patrick's Day pretty heavy here. A huge parade of drinking early in the morning, the whole nine yards. While well, some friends and I met up around four blocks from where the parade started at about 11 a.m., usually the parade starts around 2 p.m. After we finished up the pregame at my friend's house, we decided to catch the metro rail to the parade. Well, where I'm from, St. Patty's Day is a huge drinking fest, so the terminal was jam-packed with drunk people waiting to get on. So we waited about a solid 15 minutes to catch a rather empty train. Skip forward about 20 minutes, and we arrive at Terminal B to arrive at the parade. We all get off the train, and we see a group of about 10 extremely drunk people goofing around on the escalators. Running around, goofing off, when one of the kids says, I'm going to beat you guys to the bottom, and jumps off of the escalator. I am confident the gentleman did not know how high the escalator actually was. Long story short, it was about 30 to 40 feet high. The man fell head first. It was to this day the worst and most disgusting sound I have ever had the displeasure of hearing. A pool of blood surrounded the guy's head. There was one security in the terminal, frantic as could be, calling for police and the group of friends was absolutely devastated. Screaming frantically, the group of friends tried to approach the guy lying in his own pool of blood. The security guard assured the group of friends they didn't want to see the guy in the condition he was in. I'm 90% sure the man didn't make it. I walked by the lifeless body on the way out of the terminal, and the side of the man's face looked rather flat against the ground. It was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. It ruined the rest of my friend group's day, and we ended up heading home early, all slightly buzzed, instead of hammered as usual. I have not attended the parade since. Story 4 I was in Aruba vacationing in the summer of 95, chilling out at Eagle Beach. So I see a sea dew with a kid at the controls and a dad riding shotgun. They're going at quite some speed, and are looking and waving at mom who was standing next to me, filming them with a handy cam. So I see a speedboat slowly leaving shore, and it's evident he's gonna cross paths with the sea -Doo. I scream and wave at the sea -Doo, pointing ahead of them, but they still don't look ahead. The boat, about 20 feet with a huge outboard, slams into reverse. But a second later, the sea -Doo collides into its port side. The collision was so hard, the boat got lifted almost vertically in the water. Kid flew off the sea -Doo and slammed his face slash head into the boat. Mom, screaming, probably filmed the whole accident. Next thing I know, the water sports rental guys jumped on wave runners and raced to the scene. They grabbed the kid by his life jacket and lifted him onto a wave runner and rushed back to shore. No regard for safeguarding his sea spine, but it was all out of panic. They land right next to me and lay the boy on shore. Unconscious, bleeding from both ears and his nose, and he didn't have a tooth in his mouth anymore. Dad came to shore on the other wave runner. The collision was so hard that his swimming trunks got ripped off his body. Dude's standing there naked, except for the life jacket, and screaming desperately at his son to wake up. They finally lifted the kid on a lounge bed, pushed him in a pickup truck, and rushed to the hospital. But to no avail. I think the kid lost his life on impact. And if he hadn't, they probably ended his life when they hoisted him on the wave runner like that. My buddy almost fainted. I was shocked and very saddened because of the whole situation. The parents' cries were just heartbreaking. Actually, in a situation like that, the most important thing is to get the victim on the beach, not support the spine. Sure, if you can, you should. 
but there are other dangers. It would be interesting to know how old the kid was. Not sure how it works in Aruba, but in the States, you typically need a license to ride a jet ski, and you usually need to be a certain age. A bit of Googling suggests that in Ariba, the age is 18, but this might be incorrect, so anyone who wants to correct this in the comments should feel free. If this kid was indeed young, it's possible he shouldn't have been manning the controls of that thing in the first place. There are reasons for these types of restrictions, and they usually revolve around safety. The mom and dad clearly wanted a nice vacation moment, and it would be horrible to pile guilt onto people who are mourning the loss of a child, but hopefully anyone who thinks these large, fast-moving machines are just toys will take note of this story. Story 5. When I was about 13 to 14 years old, I was outside playing with my Nintendo DS along with two friends. It was about 8 or 9 p.m., but our cul-de-sac was deserted. The truck of a person who was related to someone who lived a couple houses from mine comes around the corner at an unusual speed, makes a U-turn right by us, and parks at the usual spot. No more than five minutes later, two guys on a motorcycle came around the corner too, turned right in front of us, and stopped next to this guy's truck. All of a sudden, I hear these loud crack noises, which I thought were fireworks at the time, and the guy in the back of the motorcycle falls off. Only then my brain realized I was in a dangerous situation, despite not knowing what was happening, and started running with my friends towards my house. Since I didn't have my keys on me, I had to ring the bell. My mom came down to open the door in half a second, pale as a ghost, tears running down her face. Turns out the guy in the truck was being chased by the guys in the motorcycle, who intended to rob him since he was a government official slash worked with or for the police. Honestly, I cannot tell you for sure what he did for a living. He was armed too. Guy trying to rob him didn't perish instantly, but was left there to suffer, despite paramedics and police officers being there. Two weeks later, his partner had a fatal motorcycle accident. One of the friends who was with me that night swears that as the guys in the motorcycle were turning in front of us, one of them asked the other what they were going to do with us. Honestly, I didn't hear it myself, but I often wonder what would have happened that night if it had been the other way around. Yikes! But I drive a motorcycle. No way I would be able to hear what someone else was saying unless it was really loud or was at a stop. Story 6. Just posted this on another Ask Reddit thread, but I think it qualifies. It was 9-11-16. I was going to the airport to pick up my wife. As we pass one of the parking lots, the car in front of me slams on its brakes. I throw up my arms like, what the F? At that point, my 8-year-old daughter said to me, Daddy, that plane just crashed. I look to my left, and sure enough, a small plane crashed in the parking lot 50 yards from us. I immediately pulled over and told my daughter to wait in the car. I bolted out and headed towards the crash. A handful of people were in the vicinity, kind of in shock. I have some first responder training and felt like I had to help if I could. I was the first one to approach the crash. The plane was upside down and there was airplane fuel everywhere. Cars were smashed all around it. I foolishly stood in fuel as I assessed the situation. I'm not proud of that. The first person I saw must have been the pilot. His upper body was dangling down and his lower half was trapped in the mangled metal. I yelled out to him, Can you hear me? Do you need help? No response. I moved to the other side of the plane where I saw the second person, a woman, handcuffed, dangling much in the same way as the pilot. She was also not alive. As I peeked my head around the crumpled metal, I found the third and final person, he was in the worst shape of all. That day changed my life. I had always wondered how I would respond to something like that. One part of me is relieved I didn't shy away. I went right up to the front line to help. The other part of me wonders what would have happened had a spark lit that fuel. There's really no need to wonder what would have happened if the fuel had been lit. Even if this OP hadn't been standing right in the middle of it, that still would have been a horrendously dangerous situation. Firefighters actually have special suits for dealing with fires from airplane crashes because jet fuel burns so hot. Just by standing as close to the plane as he was, this OP was taking a huge gamble that most people wouldn't take. Which is brave, of course, but with a young daughter waiting in the car, 
being brave isn't always the best thing to do. Honestly though, I'm surprised that of all the things this OP wondered about later, they didn't stop to ask why the one woman was in handcuffs. That's such an intriguing mystery, there's no way most people wouldn't have been asking questions about it. Story 7. I was 13, and I was coming back from an outing with a few of my friends. We were driving on the highway, and everyone but me and the driver were asleep. I was watching YouTube though, so the rest is what I found out after the incident. My driver had a heart attack on the highway while currently at 60 miles per hour. Out of nowhere, I feel a bunch of crashing as well as a bunch of screaming. It felt like forever, and the adrenaline was pushing so hard that I couldn't feel my legs, despite hardly being injured. I found out at the scene that we impacted four different times. One was straight into a concrete wall. My other friends weren't injured too bad. I had a fractured wrist and sprained neck. One of my friends had bit his tongue really badly, and another suffered a fractured ankle. But for the most part, it was only bruised lungs or cuts. However, the driver was put into a coma, as well as had cuts everywhere, because the airbag only protected him from the first collision. I saw other people being transported to ambulances, but it wasn't until the next day I found out that one of the cars actually flipped, and the driver of it was one of the people I saw being transported, and who didn't make it early that morning. I may not have seen how the driver didn't make it directly, but I was 13. It was single-handedly the scariest thing in my life. I had already seen enough. Being asleep slash distracted is probably what saved you guys from worse injury. Your bodies didn't tense up from anticipation. It's why drunk drivers usually survive. Story 8. My friends and I used to play by this creek. My cousin's house backed up to woods, and the creek was about a mile deep behind their home. We played with them pretty much every day during the summer. One thing we used to do was swing from one side to the other with a rope swing we made. One day we were swinging, and one of our buddies, Josh, slipped. It wasn't super uncommon to slip. You usually just fell in the creek, got wet, and went home and changed later. This time was different. Josh fell backwards and ended up hitting his head perfectly on these large rocks that were by the edge of the creek. The impact was so bad and he was bleeding profusely. My brother jumped in to make sure he didn't drown. I ended up running back to my aunt's house with one of my cousins and a friend. My brother, one cousin, and another friend stayed back. We got help, but it was too late by that point. It was just a freak accident. We fell so many times off that stupid swing and nothing ever happened. He just fell wrong that day, and it ended his life. I could hear his parents' screams from my aunt's backyard when they got back there. It was awful. A friend of mine suffered a similar fate, and hearing his mother cry and scream still haunts me. We'll be ten years old at the end of this month, and I still think about how much pain I could hear in her cries. Story 9 I was standing in a gated smoking area at the back of a bar one Saturday night. I was smoking and talking to a friend and random people when, out of the corner of my eye, I could see two guys walking up from a parking lot outside of the gated area. I didn't think too much about it because I was tipsy and no fights or aggressive behavior were occurring that night. When the two guys got to the gate, which was waist high, they climbed over and just stood there. At the time, I thought they were sneaking in to avoid the cover. Then, calmly, one of them walked up to some guy in the crowd and shot him in the back of the head behind the ear. The only thing I could compare it to is a streaming blood fountain from the nose, mouth, and bullet exit, maybe. The guy didn't drop like the movies. It seemed like an eternity, but was probably only a few seconds. He stood there with 80s-style special effects blood spraying the smoking area. Everyone ran, except for me. I was in complete shock and stood there, eyes wide. I remembered going to put the cigarette in my mouth when I tasted something funny. I looked down and blood spatters were on my arm, shirt, and cigarette. I scrubbed myself that night like you see in the movies where someone feels they can't get clean. I couldn't get the image of the bloody cigarette and taste out of my mind for a couple of days. I'm just trying to wrap my head around the fact that mere seconds after watching someone get shot through the head, 
This OP was standing there, taking a drag off his cigarette. It seems like most people would forget they were even holding the thing under those circumstances. They were almost definitely in shock, as anyone would be. Not judging them whatsoever, because it would be impossible for most people to even begin guessing at how they'd react to a situation like that. It just presents something of a darkly comic image to picture someone standing there and casually smoking while covered in blood, like that chick at the end of Ready or Not. Story 10. When I was in grad school, circa 2011, I would commute to school on the train. There were two sets of rails going each direction. The slower commuter lines on the outsides and faster bullet trains on the insides. We pulled into a station one morning, probably around 8 a.m., and people were shuffling on. I was already seated and staring out the window at the opposite side of the tracks, where this older middle-aged woman was sitting on a bench. As I'm watching, the lady stands up and starts walking onto the tracks. She gets to the inner track and stops. A few seconds later, a bullet train whizzes by. It's difficult to really describe what I saw. It didn't make sense to see a human body in so many pieces. I was studying anatomy at the time and was able to identify bits of her lungs, intestines, arms, legs, jaw, eyes, etc., all spread out over a dozen or so meters, as well as innumerable chunks of fleshy God knows what. A lot of people on the train saw, and everyone got really quiet. One man said, shouldn't we help her? A moment later, our train started moving and we left the station. I went to class, but didn't really talk much for the next week. I can still see that woman's face like it was yesterday, both intact and spread out all over the tracks. Story 11. Was driving down the road and pulled up to a car crash scene at the same time as the first cop car arrives. Wasn't sure which way the cop wanted us to go, so we drove by the wrecked car very slowly. Noticed someone under the front right wheel of the RAV4. Half of me told myself, don't look. Dude's about to be mangled as frick. Other half said, well, what if he's alive and needs help? Nope, he was super not alive. The bottom half of his body was facing the ground, and his torso and above was facing up. He was so messed up that he looked fake, as if he was from The Walking Dead. I remember his open eyes and bloody teeth so clearly. What's pretty crazy was how that incident made my group of friends and me late to the club because we were tripping out and discussing what we just saw. Well, those couple minutes actually saved us because as we arrived at the club and started to look for parking, we heard gunshots and saw people running. We noped right out of there and agreed that we should just stay in for the night. Check the news after and the shooting happened right outside the club we were planning to go to. Two people got shot one didn't make it. Story 12. I'm a rescue diver and trained in first response, living in Hawaii. Was at the beach one day with some friends and saw something floating about 200 yards out off the beach. I immediately jump into the water. I don't think I've ever swam that fast. Got halfway there and my fears were confirmed. It was a body floating face down. Got to him and flipped him over, started towing him in as fast as possible and talking to him, telling him it'll be all right. Didn't even notice how swollen and blue his face was until I got him on the beach and attempted CPR. He was pronounced not alive immediately. I'll never forget his eyes. Since then, I've seen some things worse than that, but I was 18 and I'll probably never forget that one. If the waves are big and you don't know what you're doing, don't get in the freaking water. If you're drinking, don't get in the freaking water. This actually happened to me a few weeks ago in Hawaii. It was the first day of my vacation. She looked like she was snorkeling, but her snorkel was underwater. So I flipped her over and pulled her out. Her face was so blue when I pulled her mask off. To be fair, there's no clear indication that the man didn't know what he was doing. The ocean is dangerous. Knowing how to swim, how to dive, and so on will only keep you from making stupid mistakes. And even then, people can do something expertly for years and still make mistakes from time to time. For instance, experienced scuba divers still sometimes come up too fast and wind up getting decompression sickness. In some cases, they even lose their life because of it. The best advice has nothing to do with avoiding water altogether, 
Simply understand that when you step foot into the ocean, you assume certain risks. Most of the time, nothing will come of them, but you just never know. Story 13. Walking home from school, age 12. Some of the rougher lads in my year were forever roughing up this one lad, pure bullying-like. On that day, they chased after him. I was a pretty geeky introvert and walking with my equally geeky friend, so we were just walking, hoping the rougher, tougher lads didn't take exception to us. They chased him about a hundred yards ahead and sort of had him on the ground, giving him a bad time, like kicking and hitting. Not majorly beating his butt, but must have been horrible for him. They got bored and let him go. He jumped up, crying, and ran off like a shot. Thinking it was done, the rough lad swaggered off, when all of a sudden, the lad they'd beaten up came running back down the road and launched a house brick at the group of them. It hit this one lad straight in the head, and he dropped like a sack of potatoes. The lad who threw the brick ran off, and everyone went into absolute panic trying to wake the unconscious lad up. Being 12, no sucker knew what to do. Some staff from a nearby care home came out and tried CPR, but it was no use. Story 14. First time I've experienced mortality. It wasn't as violent as it is more traumatic, but no child or parent should go through what I saw and experienced. I was in an outpatient facility for treatment when they rushed in a toddler, and I could hear the nurses saying code blue. The baby was stiff and purple in color. From the looks of it, the baby could have suffered some convulsions or seizure of some sort. They weren't able to usher me out of the area fast enough, as every available nurse and doctor was trying to revive the little girl. Mom was hysterical and inconsolable. The kid was a mere one to two feet away from me. The doctors eventually stopped life-saving procedures and wheeled the kid and the family away. From what I can understand, the kid passed away of measles and was days away from a scheduled vaccination. One day, the kid was fine, and the next, her condition deteriorated fast. My wife is a nurse, and the stories she tells about the pediatric ER ward are insane. Takes a special breed of person to work there. Story 15. I'm not sure if this counts, but I'll share anyways. I was in my apartment minding my own business when my roommate's 16-year-old daughter, who we'll call Sheridan, comes running up to the door, screaming and pounding on it. She didn't have her key, telling us to open the door. I opened it, and my roommate was behind me, and we see Sheridan and her friend, who we'll call Alan. Alan had his t-shirt off and held against his head, which was bleeding profusely, and he stumbled onto a small bench we had outside of the apartment. My roommate and I were trying to figure out what was wrong, and it took a minute to get Sheridan to calm down and stop screaming and crying enough to tell us. Apparently, Alan had gotten into a fight with another person around his age, 18 or so, and as Alan and Sheridan tried to walk away, the other person hit Alan over the head with a shovel. We called an ambulance, and he passed away in the hospital two days later. What the heck is wrong with people? Once the other person starts walking away, the fight is over. I understand some people get blinded by anger and just aren't thinking clearly, but in what universe do you think you're going to hit somebody with an object like a shovel and not do severe damage? You can't even blame the superhuman way that people fight each other in movies without ever seeming to get hurt because they had already been fighting at this point. The other kid already should have learned the first few times he threw a fist that real people are a lot more fragile than your average Hawkeye. This kid might have given up ever seeing sunlight again just because he lost his temper. This is what I meant when I said that senseless would be today's theme. Story 16. This happened in 2010. I was driving my dad's car on my way home. There was a truck parked on the other side of the road, around 150 to 200 meters from my position. Then, not too far from behind the truck, there was a man on a bike. He was not wearing a helmet, speeding up maybe around 60 kilometers an hour. Right before the man went past the truck, the truck driver opened the door and it hit the man on the bike. The man lost his balance and, probably in panic, he hit his front brake too hard. He was thrown and hit his head, and it splattered on the road, brain and all. I saw that from the start to the end up close as I drove by. I pulled over after passing the truck, threw everything up in my stomach, and blacked out for a couple of minutes, 
until someone nearby woke me up. I couldn't eat meat or anything that resembles meat for a little bit more than one month. I'm still shuddering every time I pass that spot, even until now. Always wear your helmet. Story 17. When I was in the Peace Corps in Ghana, I saw a man stoned. He had stolen a taxi in a nearby city and brought it to the village I was staying in. Unfortunately for him, the man he stole the taxi from was from the village he brought it to. I'm not sure how he didn't know this, as it seemed everyone knew everyone in the surrounding villages and cities. The villagers ganged up on him and stoned him in the street. Men, women, and children all participated. It was a very strange, surreal experience, and horrifying. None of the volunteers knew what to do. All the Peace Corps volunteers in the village received counseling to process. It's been over 10 years, and I still think about that day often. The crazy thing is that people like you and me are shocked and disgusted by this, whereas those villagers just viewed it as justice. Like, even the kids didn't seem to think much about it. That's so wild to think about. Sorry you had to witness that. Story 18. I was doing security at a celebration for the Indianapolis Colts and was walking through an alley downtown when a guy who had jumped off of the pool deck of a hotel landed about five feet away from me. I stood in shock for a few seconds and then walked over to him. He had a compound fracture of his leg, but it wasn't gory at all, just a bit of bone sticking out of the skin. There was a small stream of blood going from his head towards the curb. Maybe 30 seconds later, a few policemen and my supervisor came running around the corner and took over. It affected me pretty badly for about 24 hours, but then the news broke that he was a child molester who jumped when the cops were closing in on him. The moment I heard that, I was fine. It was like it never happened. Talk about witnessing karma in action. It would probably bother me seeing it, but not who it happened to. This is one of those things where Reddit likes to forget what karma actually means. What the man did was terrible, but no one who wishes horrific fatalities on another human being is exactly a pillar of justice. It's a little frightening to think what the legal system might look like if Redditors were in charge. Draconian law would probably look borderline utopian by comparison. It's a little ironic reading this right after the cab story, where the top commenter referred to extreme justice as shocking and disgusting. The closest thing to karma here has nothing to do with doling out justice for the man's crimes. It does sort of apply to the fact that he jumped off the roof. If you jump, you're going to land. And if even most cats wouldn't attempt the jump you're making, don't expect to land softly. Story 19 was on the train when someone jumped into it. It wasn't so visual, but you physically felt the train run over them. They didn't perish right away, and we were in between stops, more rural area, so you could hear him, and the back car had to move up because they could all see him. We all had to sit on the train for three hours until police escorted us down the tracks half a mile to the next station since it was now part of an investigation. It sucked and shook me. It has since happened two more times. It still is awful, and you feel awful, but you also really start to get ticked off at the person who did it for screwing up your day and giving you that memory. As one of the police officers whose job it is to deal with these incidents, I'll tell you now, it never gets any easier. We average one a day in my area. Story 20. Little League baseball practice at a local school, all of us like 9 to 10 years old. Someone batted a foul ball, and a kid ran to get it. Out the fence, in between some parked cars on the street. Screech, thud. We all turned when we heard the tires, and through the parked car windows, we saw the kid kind of fly back from being hit. The driver wasn't speeding or anything, but it was like 25 to 30 miles per hour, and he just got hit wrong. The EMT called it at the scene, and all of our parents came to get us. We were all just numb and sort of staring into space for a few days. I don't remember much other than my thought of, that was bad, I don't want that to ever happen to me, was so big that it crowded out all other details of the incident at the time. Story 21. Not sure if I'd say violent, but traumatizing. My mom and dad were cooling off after an argument. My dad was giving me lunch in my high chair. I was almost three years old. My mom was in another room of the house and was giving my dad the silent treatment. My dad had a heart attack and didn't make it, right in front of me, while I sat strapped in that high chair. 
My mom has no idea how long he had been lying there lifeless by the time she heard me screaming and crying. I don't remember the incident. I remember the funeral home and other bits and pieces around that time. I had a strange fascination with morbidity after that. I would have panic attacks and have what I believe were psychogenic seizures. I'd just black out when I thought about mortality too much. It had to have been pretty traumatizing for the mother, too. The only thing worse than losing someone you love is losing them right after a fight. At least in this case, they were cooling off and probably knew that they'd move on eventually. She obviously didn't plan on giving him the silent treatment forever, and hopefully that knowledge keeps her from feeling too much of the guilt. But it's still always hard. We place a lot of importance on our last memory with somebody. Perhaps more than we should, since our final moments with someone are rarely perfect. In the end, it's the whole of our relationship with them that matters, not the one moment we'll never be able to change. Story 22 My cousin ended another person's life in self-defense. We were at a club and in the parking lot when another group of people started arguing with my cousins. We were heading away when one guy got out and kicked the car and spit on it. He then runs back to the passenger side of his vehicle and my cousin gets out yelling at him. The guy pulls a gun and fires but misses. During this, my cousin pulled his gun, but did not miss. He was charged with red rum, but being a CCP holder, voluntarily turned himself in. Multiple shells on the ground, eyewitness statements, and other things, he was found not guilty eventually. Story 23. My dad was driving me home from school when I was 10-ish. We were the frontmost vehicle stopped at a red light when we saw a motorcycle turn into the intersection and get totally screamed at by an oncoming Mack truck. Traffic stopped and people ran out of their cars to help him, but his motorcycle was pinned under the truck's grill with him still on it. A squad car promptly showed up and one of the officers started waving traffic through the intersection, so we ended up leaving before we saw the ambulance arrive. We read in the news that the poor cyclist didn't make it at the scene. Story 24 My dad shot himself when we were all home. It was the middle of the night and I remember running to his room. At the time, I didn't realize it, but it was too late, so I did all the knee-jerk CPR stuff. When I went to check the airway, there was stuff in his mouth. I cleared it out. Turns out, it was brain matter. In some ways, it was like a movie, where there was just so much blood. It occurs to me that this may not meet the criteria. Story 25 I didn't witness it, but I found my best friend after she hung herself when I was 15. It looked like she tried to save herself. She was still warm when I cut her down. I wouldn't wish that moment on anyone. It's been three years, and I still lay awake most nights thinking about it. Hey, I'm not trying to preach, but I hope you're talking to a therapist or someone about this. Don't suffer in silence, please. Story 26 During a flash flood, I saw people drown in debris-filled water. Some people were clinging to the light posts on the flooded highway. One by one, they would run out of strength and lose their grip. I was totally helpless. Though I am a strong swimmer, going into that dark, churning, debris-filled water would have been seppuku. In fact, several rescuers didn't make it trying just that. Stood there at the edge of a steep hill I lived on, in the rain, couldn't move. Being a strong swimmer is great in a lot of circumstances, but this definitely isn't one of them. Of course, we should do what we can to help others when we have the ability. But if you aren't positive that you do, swimming out to help someone who's trapped might simply add to the number of people who need rescuing. It's hard to stand by and do nothing, but sometimes it's the only choice that prevents even more loss from occurring. Story 27 A guy was walking out of a parking garage, looking at his phone, and walked right into traffic. An SUV a few cars ahead of me hit him, and he perished. So many people are guilty of walking with their head down and their phones every day. I actively try to keep myself from doing that. Story 28. I just want to say that I find it interesting that the majority of the comments are about car accidents. People, please, for the love of God, wear your seatbelt. Don't text and drive, don't drink and drive, and pay attention to your surroundings. Please. And sometimes, just slow the frick down. Story 29. Saw a pedestrian get hit by a tractor trailer. It was bad. She was decapitated, and the smell was something I will never forget. 
This is actually morbidly fascinating, just because they aren't clear on what smell they're talking about. Bodies take time to start developing an odor, don't they? Or do they just mean the copper smell we associate with blood? In any case, this might certainly be the most depressing thread we've ever covered here. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to stand blankly in the shower and muse over the inevitability of the great beyond, and how the most fragile thing we'll ever lay claim to is our own mortality. And then I'll probably watch National Treasure. Should be a rather uplifting day. Please leave your stories in the comments. I'd love to make a video of them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.